Hello, my name is Kyle Allred, and I am co-founder of MedCram.com and course producer here. And I'm here with Dr. Roger Schwelt. I'm going to bring him in now. How are you doing, Dr. Schwelt? Very good. Thanks, Kyle. And so this is our, uh, our first time going live with a question and answer. We did a, a live event a couple weeks ago, and we really enjoyed the question and answer portion of it. So we thought it'd be cool to go through um, some of our updates and uh, look through the comment section on our website and on our YouTube channel and just gather some questions from the week. And, and I'm going to tee them up to uh, Dr. Schwelt here and we'll see how it goes. And we'll also look um, at comments as they come in during the stream. So um, thanks in advance for your patience with us as we figure out how to do this. So. First question that I gathered was um, from Francesco de Pascale, and he said, the therapeutic time window seems to be the key here for antiviral meds. Would you agree? Absolutely. So the problem is, is that you've got a viral infecting the cells at the very beginning of all of this, and then that causes a cascade of events to occur that have ramific ramifications down the line. And by the time you've, you've got a situation down the line where you've got this storm going on, the virus may be long gone. I can think of an example of that. We actually had a, uh, a young lady that came into the hospital. Uh, she had relatives that had tested positive, Kyle, for, for COVID-19 and um, multiple relatives that she was living with tested positive for COVID-19 and they were on the road to recovery. But she came in with uh, bilateral infiltrates, ground glass opacification, fever. I mean, all the classic symptoms of COVID-19. And we tested her three different times for COVID-19. And each time she was negative. And, and the reason was is because her, her immune system had already taken care of the virus. She was no longer shedding the virus. The problem was is that the downstream effects of the infection had already taken place. So you know, would this be somebody that would benefit from remdesivir? I'm not sure. It's possible, but the virus was probably not reproducing anymore. We just had the ill effects of perhaps the oxidative stress that we've talked about or microclots in the lungs that were preventing her from oxygenating well. And so maybe other treatments down the line there. So yeah, this is, this is a complicated uh, thing. Not only do you have to get the right meds in at the right time, but you've got to get it in at the right phase uh, of, of, the, of the illness, it would seem. Excellent. I uh, had a question here on our YouTube uh, channel today on our update video from Joe Consumer. He said that he sees that an adverse reaction from remdesivir is elevated liver transaminases, just like from Tylenol overdose. Does that mean that remdesivir causes oxidative damage in addition to the body's reaction to COVID-19 infection that may also cause oxidative damage. Yeah, I could see why you would ask that question. The thing that you've got to understand though is that elevated liver enzymes or transaminases, that be AST, ALT, they can happen for a number of different reasons in addition to just oxidative stress. So even though they are elevated, it doesn't necessarily mean that the process going on is working through an oxidative stress mechanism. There are other reasons why it could go up. Uh, hepatitis, direct inflammation of the cells uh, can also cause elevated liver enzymes. Great. And had a question uh, just come in from someone in Switzerland, and she wanted to know any information on the lingering symptoms of COVID-19 even after recovery um, for many patients. Are there any, have you seen any sequelae even after they've recovered? Yeah, so a lot of those symptoms are very diverse. Um, one of the symptoms could be shortness of breath. You know, there was that New England Journal of Medicine article that showed these micro clots right next to the alveoli in the lungs. And what they were suggesting in that article was that the body was making new pathways around those clots, sort of like a, an accident on the freeway and then taking the surface streets to get back on the freeway after the, after the accident. That takes some time. And so it's possible that you could be rid of the virus, but still have symptoms of shortness of breath, um, dyspnea on exertion, we call that. And so, yeah, for, from a shortness of breath standpoint, from a pneumonia standpoint, from a abnormal chest x-ray standpoint, 
it's very possible that you could have ongoing lingering symptoms even after the virus is completely cleared out of the system. And that kind of alludes to the first case that we were talking about where we had that young lady as well. There's, there's downstream effects that are occurring. Um, in terms of inflammation, I know of, a, of a, a nurse in the hospital that became infected with coronavirus and he's still having issues with regaining his sense of smell. So that could be related to inflammation in the olfactory area. And once that inflammation comes down, then those symptoms, you know, obviously are going to become more mild and may even disappear completely. Excellent. And we had a question that just came in from uh, TP is their username. And they were wondering, are you still taking hot and cold showers, Dr. Schwelt? And are you also taking vitamin D? zinc, uh, NAC, and vitamin C. You did an update video on that some time back. Are you still sticking with that regimen? Yeah, so, so the secret to my success is, is that I just tell my wife exactly what it is that I need to take, and she makes sure that it is there on the kitchen table in the morning. I don't even have to think about it. So yes, I, I am definitely, I have to take those. I cannot, I'm not allowed to leave the house <laughs> unless those things are taken, but yes, uh, the, the cotton cold showers, of course, is not a pill on the table in the morning. But yes, we do that. Um, I'm lucky enough to have uh, bought a number of years ago a, uh, a small spa uh, for a few thousand dollars that I got at a, at a county fair. And it was kind of laying there dormant. But then when this came up and I started reading and understanding about hot and cold, now I've got that thing all fired up and uh, we're using it uh, every night. Now, you don't need to have a spa or a sauna to do the same thing as we've talked about. You can do exactly the same thing that we're talking about using a hot shower and, um, and a cold shower to follow. So what, I, what we, I recommend is five minutes of as hot as you can take it, and then one minute as cold as you can take it, then three minutes is hot, and then one minute cold, three minutes hot, one minute cold. And uh, be, be careful if you have a tendency to have cardiac arrhythmias because that cold will uh, invigorate you, it will cause a adrenaline surge, and that's not something you wanna have if you're predisposed to having cardiac arrhythmias. But yes, I am taking the quercetin, I'm taking the NAC, I'm taking the vitamin D. In fact, I just had my vitamin D levels checked recently, and they were in the mid 40s, and my understanding is uh, that we would like to have them kind of above 50, so I've gone up a little bit on my vitamin D in this case, I think we're taking around 2,500 international units a day. But I'll stress, just because it's right for me, it doesn't mean it's right for you. You might be in the sun more often than I am. You might be more fair uh, skin uh, than, than I am. And in that case, you're going to need less supplement because you're going to have a higher vitamin D level. So it's uh, I am still taking all of those things, the zinc as well. Yes, I'm still taking the zinc um, and uh, yeah, multivitamin, all of those things. Good to hear. Um, great question from Looney Looney is the, is the uh, username that just came in. Any thoughts on anoxaprin um, or other anticoagulants in early treatment before endothelial damage is likely to take place? So that's a good question. I think probably, so first of all, let me uh, back up a little bit. There's two dosages that you would use for anoxaparin which is a low molecular weight heparin. There is the prophylactic dose that we typically give patients who are in bed in the hospital to prevent them from getting deep venous thromboses or VTE. Uh, and then there's the treatment dose, which is one milligram per kilogram. Um, so a 70 kilogram man would be 70 milligrams subcutaneously twice a day of, of anoxaparin or Lovenox. And the question I'm imagining is, should we, we be using that dose in somebody before they come down with the symptoms of Lovenox or even if they've come down with symptoms before they start getting short of breath. You know, we've used, there, there are side effects to using that type of a strong dose of Lovenox. I've seen spontaneous uh, hematomas form. So it's a risk benefit ratio. I would not recommend using it prophylactically where, where I think it has been advocated in terms of use and we don't have the randomized controlled trials to look at that is out of Great Britain, they've been talking about using it if the uh, uh, D-dimer level is six times the upper limit of normal. Then they, there has been some people that have been advocating the use of full dose anticoagulation. And that's again, because of the clots that we've been seeing 
uh, most recently in the New England Journal of Medicine article that came out about a week or so ago. Uh, I, I may want to add, in addition to that, that those clots that they found were very rich in von Willebrand factor and in platelets, something that you wouldn't necessarily see, for instance, in a DVT in a leg that had embolized to the lung. And so the question really comes down to, are these clots forming right there in the lung, in situ, as we would say, or are these the results of embolic phenomenon that are getting wedged in there? Don't really know. Uh, an additional side bar there, Kyle, is that uh, we've talked about NAC and acetylcysteine and the fact that it can cleave disulfide bonds. Uh, this is done through its uh, thiol group on the N-acetylcysteine. It's what makes liquid N-acetylcysteine kind of smell like rotten eggs. Well, these are the same disulfide bonds that we see in the polymerization of von Willebrand factor. In fact, there was a recent study that showed that when you incubate polymerized von Willebrand factors with N-acetylcysteine, it greatly reduced the polymer length. So it may be another benefit of N-acetylcysteine in this kind of a situation. But again, we don't have randomized placebo-controlled trials. They are looking at that at Sloan Kettering. They're giving up to six grams intravenously a day of N-acetylcysteine for potential oxidative stress effects and maybe also for anticoagulant effects. So I hope that answers that, that person's question there. Lo Looney, Looney, you said it was? Yes. Yep. Okay. Excellent. This question just came by, and I, I didn't catch the username on it, but um, is basically, should we, there's been a lot of um, coverage about how ventilators are relatively ineffective for very uh, patients with very severe COVID-19 in late stages. Yeah. What is the role of ventilators at this time with what we know? You know, I'm going to sound a lot like... Um... Uh, the, the ER physician from New York. I, I really don't know what's kind of going on with these ventilators. And I'll, I'll give you a key point. In our, in our MedCram video that we put out called How Coronavirus Kills, a very popular video that we did, we talked about ARDS. And in that video, we talked about three studies that have been done, three very, very uh, pivotal landmark studies all three, incidentally, were published in the New England Journal of Medicine. All three, since 2000, showed mortality benefits with three different uh, interventions. The first intervention was low tidal volume. The second intervention was paralysis when the patient's on pressure control ventilation. And the third one was proning. So interesting thing, Kyle, was that the control group in all of those studies the control group, in other words, the people that didn't get the intervention, the mortality was around 40%, okay, 40, 50%, somewhere in that range. So that means if you're not really doing much for the ARDS, you're just ventilating them, you would expect 50% of the people to get better, 50% to die. That's what those studies show. When you look at the JAMA article that was published out in New York, we're talking 80% of the people there dying. And, and it kind of makes me think about this analogy. Think about a, a septic shock patient falling out of a plane. Okay. You may do the absolute best care you possibly can for the septic shock in that patient as they're falling from 30,000 feet. But unless you pull a parachute, unless you pull the ripcord, uh, it's always going to end in a hundred percent mortality. And that's what I'm wondering is going on here is we're, we're, these patients are ending up on the ventilator because they can't breathe. They're hypoxic. Their worker breathing is, is bad. And, and by the way, we're, I would say most of the medical infrastructure, the med medical uh, professionals, we're not intubating people anymore because they're hypoxic. Uh, the, they're, they're known as the happy hypoxic. We're intubating people because they just can't keep up with the breathing that they have to do. Their, what we call their work of breathing is so much, they're tired, they can't breathe anymore. That's when we would put them on, on the ventilator. But even when we put them on the ventilator, it's all it's doing is just bridging them to some time when they get better. That's all a ventilator does. A ventilator is not a treatment, okay? A ventilator is a support, it's a bridge. Imagine a pillar holding up a ceiling and that pillar falls. All we're doing is holding up the ceiling. That's what a ventilator does until the lungs can get back online and hold up that ceiling for itself. 
So the ventilator is not killing people. It's just sustaining their life until they get better. The problem is, is that there's some underlying pathology, pathophysiology, some sort of underlying condition. Maybe it's the vasculature we've theorized. And it's just not getting better. And because of that, these patients have a much higher mortality rate, it seems, than the control groups in the traditional ARDS patients that we had over the last 20 years. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, it does. And, uh, okay, a lot of questions coming in, so I'm just going to move right on. Um, So you want me to speed up here uh, my answers, perhaps, so we can get (laughs) to more of them? No, we're not into the speed round yet, but we're we're getting close. Um, A user named Mum Sami wants to know, any thoughts on whether naproxen has any antiviral activity? Yeah, actually, well, indomethacin, I think, was the one that's been studied. It, It is directly inhibitory to the SARS virus one, number one, the original SARS, 2002. Um, That was one of the benefits they thought of it. The problem is, is that indomethacin NSAIDs in general are going to inhibit uh, a number of things, prostaglandins, right? And it's the prostaglandins that are, that are implicated in creating a fever. And it's, it's thought that a fever is beneficial in terms of getting rid of the virus because a fever or elevated temperature uh, is stimulatory to natural killer cells, monocytes. These are the the very parts of your innate immune system that are attacking the virus. So I think indomethacin, naproxen, naproxen, these are all double-edged swords. On one hand, they may inhibit the virus, at least the SARS Cov one, if you want to call it that, the first one back in 2002. We don't know. I don't have any data about the second one. But on the other hand, it also reduces your body's innate immune system. Excellent. And then a question from, um, let me switch the camera here. Question from uh, the update video today in the comment section um, from, uh, I'm going to butcher the name here, Opini Fakta. And the question is, If someone receives plasma therapy, will his body be able to build immunity in the future if he gets reinfected with COVID-19? Yes, good question. So this is one of the theoretical theoretical disadvantages with giving plasma is that um, part of how you develop antibodies is by having antigens stimulate your immune system. By giving passive immunity, that's giving somebody else's antibodies, you're binding up those antigens so they're not seen by your immune system. And so it is possible that you might get an incomplete immunity to the virus if you give them a plasma. We're giving people plasma in the hospital because we want to save their life. So we're not so much concerned about them having complete immunity later on. We're just hoping that they are going to be around later on. So in that situation, when you weigh the risks and the benefits, that's a risk that you're willing to take. And another question from our, uh, the update video today um, from Mr. Kane. I would absolutely love to hear your thoughts on the um, study published in The Lancet looking at patients treated with hydroxychloroquine versus other treatments. I think a Harvard professor may have been involved in that study. Yeah, yeah, very good study. Um, it was a retrospective study, so that's the first thing that you've got to keep in mind, and we'll come back to that. But what it showed was that Um, that the arm that had hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin in it uh, was the arm that was associated with a higher mortality and some some negative outcomes. But but that's what happens whenever you do a retrospective study is it's always associated with. um, And and that's all you can say. Retrospective studies are never the end all be all because they don't tell you everything. There's too many confounders. There was a retrospective study that was done at um, New York City University Grossman School of Medicine uh, where they looked at hydroxychloroquine and zinc and compared it to just hydroxychloroquine alone. And they found that in the zinc arm, it was associated with a lower mortality. And so what does that mean? Well, it means that we really need to do a prospective study looking at hydroxychloroquine and zinc. Unfortunately, the WHO has temporarily stopped their their, uh, trial uh, because they cited this very paper as of having uh, arrhythmias and things that were associated with that arm. 
here's the thing you may you, you know people may not be old enough to remember this but back in the 90s and 2000s uh, we were routinely giving women hormone replacement therapy because we thought it reduced strokes we thought that it reduced heart attacks it was also it took away the symptoms of menopause it was a it was a plus plus it was a win win all the way around and all of the data was based on retrospective studies. It was all retrospective studies. And we knew, even then, no, we have to do a prospective study because retrospective studies are fraught with all sorts of, of, of problems. So they did the Women's Health Initiative, and it was a prospective study looking at hormone replacement therapy. And what do you know? There was a collective gasp when the results came out. There was a collective jaw dropped, why? because it showed that those in the arm with hormone replacement had a increased risk of stroke, increased risk of heart attack. And because of that, they had to stop. So now hormone replacement therapy, even though it looked beautiful in the retrospective studies, prospectively it just didn't pan out. And that's why this argument about hydroxychloroquine isn't going to finish until we have a randomized controlled trial with hydroxychloroquine and I believe with zinc. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, then we'll know for good whether or not this thing is gonna work. A lot of questions coming in about um, ivermectin and uh, any updates on that? Haven't seen any updates. You know, ivermectin is a one-time kind of dose. You give it once a week. Uh, we've been giving it to our patients in the hospital. The way it seems to work is the virus, when it infects the cell, it uses the nuclear transport device where proteins get transported into the nucleus. And the virus sends some of its proteins in there. It can actually shut down some of the immune functions of the cell, and especially if that cell is an immune cell. And what ivermectin does is it prevents the virus from using that transport system to transport those proteins in. And so therefore you get a more robust immune response, which is something that would be very beneficial in specifically COVID-19 because there's a lot of time between when the symptoms come on and when the patients need to go to the hospital. On average, about seven or eight days based on the initial Lancet study that came out of Wuhan, China. Question just came in about um, zinc ionophores and quercetin, which uh, you did a video update uh, a while back about quercetin. And would you like to see a study with zinc and uh, quercetin as opposed to zinc and hydroxychloroquine? I would love to see that study. You know, there is two researchers, one from Canada and the other one from China. This was really early in the outbreak. They were looking at quercetin or quercetin, however you want to say it. Um, it. It does act as a zinc ionophore. It seem to have had activity in the first virus, first SARS virus, I believe also Ebola, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I think the, the Canadian doctor's name is Dr. Katien, who's studying it. And um, I don't know whether or not they believe it works because it is a zinc ionophore or because it may have other properties. It's possible that the way it works is through a zinc ionophore activity. And if that is the case, it certainly wouldn't hurt to give zinc with the, uh, the medication to see if that helps. But I believe that they are doing studies on this uh, as we speak. Uh, at least that was, the, that was what I read back in February. You've been in the ICU a lot lately, uh, working some extra shifts. What, any, any updates from the front lines, if you will, um, uh, in, in the ICU and uh, anything new you guys are doing over the last few weeks for your COVID-19 patients? Yeah, so we're now able to get plasma uh, much more effectively. And, and that's not because of the hospital, that's just because the blood bank that we're working with is now accumulating uh, a, a certain amount of plasma so that we can actually give it to patients. That's number one. Number two is for the last week or so, we've been getting remdesivir pretty frequently and we're now starting it. It's extremely controlled. We need to get an infectious disease specialist okay and a critical care specialist okay after looking at the, at the case. You know, one of the things that concerned me about that, Kyle, was a recent article that was published that showed that the very patients that we are reserving it for, the sickest patients, the, one on, the ones on the mechanical ventilator, 
are the ones based on the study that may benefit the least um, because uh, it just doesn't have as much of an effect at that line. It kind of goes back to the very first question that we had on this live stream, which was, is there a timeline for giving medications? Um, the other thing that I notice in the hospital is that these patients, when they're on the ventilator, they're just not really getting better fast. Uh, some of these patients are very sick. They die as soon as they come in. Uh, I would say the majority of them, when they come in, they, it's a slow course, a slowly getting worse. Then they end up on the ventilator and they're on the ventilator for, for days, uh, sometimes even weeks. We've had some patients there for a very long time. And it just seems like it's a bridge, but it's a very, very long bridge uh, to, to something that, um, that, that's being worked on in the body and it's, it's just taking its toll. Um, we are not, at the hospitals that I'm working at, we, we have plenty of personal protective equipment. The, the hospitals that I'm working at are, are very creative uh, in terms of making sure that we have the right type of PPE and the right amount. They're taking um, staff that would normally be in physical therapy, speech therapy, occupational therapy, and they are using them as what they call PPE buddies, right? So they, they're watching and making sure that people are getting in and out of their PPE very carefully, making sure that they're doing the right thing in the right order. And uh, I, I can't say enough about how at least the hospitals that I'm working at are doing an ex outstanding job. Every day we have updates about what's going on, things that are changing. It's a fluid situation. And so uh, they're doing a, a wonderful job. And I'm really proud to be on staff at those hospitals. Excellent. And have you um, any any update on heart attacks and strokes in the patients that you're seeing in the ICU or, or that your colleagues are seeing? You know, I have been looking for those ever since we heard news out of New York that they were seeing a lot of patients with strokes, young ones. We've had a number of strokes that have come in and when we've tested them, they've been negative. So I haven't seen that patient yet who is otherwise normal, but has had a massive stroke because of COVID-19. I haven't seen it yet. Haven't seen that yet with heart attack. Um, we're looking for it. We're, we're testing just about every single person now that comes into the uh, hospital for COVID-19. Uh, we don't want to miss anybody. Uh, it's no longer a situation where, you know, you look at them and say, you know, this one's got lung disease. This one doesn't have lung disease. This one has a pneumonia. This one doesn't. Honestly, these patients can come in completely asymptomatic and they could be spreading COVID-19. Um, a lot of questions about prevention and what, what folks can do, um, whether it's diet and lifestyle supplements. I know you've already, we, we've talked about it a little bit on this Q and A, we, we've talked about it in previous updates, but if you had a patient, let's say that recovered in the ICU and they said, Hey, I want to go tell my family, um, you know, kind of a preventative regimen, if you will, with what we know now, what would you recommend to them? So I forgot which, which one it was, Kyle, which update that we did, but we sort of ran through all of the supplements that I'm taking, and, uh, and I'm not taking them just because I think it's, it, it might work. I think that there's a pathophysiological basis for work, pretty, pretty good chance that it, it, it's going to help. Um, but more importantly, it's, it's not going to hurt at the dosages that we're, we're using. So we talked about quercetin. We talked about NAC. We got good data on NAC in influenza. Um, those people taking it over a winter didn't get the flu less often, but they certainly had less severe symptoms of the flu when they got it. And that's really what's, that's key. Um, cause you get, you get to have immunization when you get the flu, right? Uh, if you get the coronavirus, you don't want to stop yourselves from getting the coronavirus. You just want to make sure you never knew that you had it. I mean, that's the best scenario is getting coronavirus and never knowing that you had it. And you just come through without any symptoms. Now, You've got antibodies against it. You don't have to worry about it potentially, maybe, uh, and, and you don't have symptoms. Um, but other things that you can do, yeah, um, we know. I can just tell you by looking at the patients that uh, it's people with a larger BMI. That's a body mass index. Um, people who are overweight, people who have diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease. These are the people that seem to not do well when they get COVID-19. So we already know how to fix that. Uh, Kyle, we already know that it's generally a Western diet that increases the incidence of coronary disease, a Western diet that increases the risk of diabetes and hypertension and, um, you know, eating more healthy 
and uh, doing those sorts of things. We can certainly talk about those in, uh, in upcoming MedCram uh, lectures, but there's more than ample evidence out there that tells us how to lower our BMI and how to uh, reduce uh, cardiovascular disease. There's a couple of good books, actually, uh, one by T. Colin Campbell called The China Study. That's an excellent book. It, it really, uh, forget the word China there, it has nothing to do with the, 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 the virus. It's actually, this was published many, many years ago, and it, it was a study that looked at what was the diet of Chinese in the rural parts of China, where they didn't get around very often, they weren't upwardly mobile, uh, and what were the diets of those that were living in, in the city, Shanghai, Beijing. And uh, without, with, almost without exception, the diets in the cities were more westernized. And uh, the diets in the rural towns were very agrarian, um, uh, plant-based. And the people in China were dying from very different things in the cities versus the countries. And so that, that was a, it was a huge epidemiological study that, that looked at. The other one that, uh, that I think is an excellent book, I actually give it to my patients, and it's not too expensive. It's called How to Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease. We all know how to prevent heart disease, but the surprising words in that title is How to Reverse Heart Disease. This was written by a cardiothoracic surgeon out of the Cleveland Clinic by the name of uh, Esselstein, Codwell Esselstein. And uh, he used to take patients to the operating room to operate on their coronary vessels. And he had about 20 patients who they were just too sick to even take to the operating room. Well, he put them on a very strict diet and took angiograms before and after. And, and the, 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 studies, the, the studies are amazing. I, I mean, I don't, you could probably look them up on, on Google and just type in that and you'll see the angiograms and they're, they're amazing. The, the, the one thing I'll add before we go to the next question is that uh, the last third of that book is a cookbook and it's uh, consistent with the diet that he put them on. So if they're interested in, in trying to uh, further their, um, you know, they can find things in their lifestyle that they know are probably not the best and they want to make, try to make a change. That's probably one of the best places to start. Okay. Just to push back on you a little bit on that one, we had a couple people write in saying, well, what about the reports that maybe there were some weak associations with the China study or there were some problems with the, the data collection? Are you aware of those criticisms of that particular study? Anytime you have an epidemiological study, that's always going to be a weakness is data collection. But it's such a, a large study. I mean, we can talk about other epidemi the largest epidemiological study ever done on diet was the Avenus Health Study, number one and number two. And that basically showed that BMI was directly related to uh, to diet. So, uh, and we're talking ninety thousand people uh, in that epidemiological study. So that's pretty hard to to mess up. Got it. Okay. A question here from Jeremy Sender. He said, "Can you explain the the theoretical uh, antiviral effect of azithromycin?" Yeah, that you know that blew me away too. I'm glad you asked that question. So. Um, we think that, okay, so this is how I approached it. So yeah, we're all talking about the same thing here. It's that French study and we're like, yay, hydroxychloroquine, it's going to work. And then all of a sudden azithromycin, we're like, what? And it's like this moment of silence here. We're like, why azithromycin? So we've used azithromycin for years in the pulmonary, uh, arena and it has absolutely nothing to do with its antimicrobial effects, right? We all know that azithromycin is a macrolide. It hits the 50S subunit of, of bacteria and shuts down translation. But, but um, azithromycin is also an anti-inflammatory. And so that may be how it's working. We use macrolides in uh, COPD exacerbations, okay? So, and we're not necessarily trying to sterilize the, uh, the, the bronchus. So the, it kind of made a little bit of sense to me because I've used azithromycin, quote unquote, off label. So patients who have COPD and they're getting repeat exacerbations over and over and over again, we'll put them on 250 milligrams of azithromycin three times a week in those patients. And what we see is that their exacerbations go down. Well, you could argue, well, it might be related to the fact that you're treating occult infections. Well, it's possible, but the markers of inflammation go down anyway. So is it possible that azithromycin is working through a different mechanism than what we might think? Maybe it's not an antiviral. 
Maybe it is an antibacterial, but it's not working that way in this situation. Maybe it's, it's working through the fact that it's um, an anti-inflammatory. But before we leave that question, it, it was very clear in that study that was, came out of France that the number of viral load was significantly reduced when you combine hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. Don't know how to explain that. Um, one of the things that I was immediately concerned about when I saw that, though, was that they are both medicines that can prolong the QTC. Well, what is the QTC? It's basically a way of timing from the start of depolarization to the, to the end, to the start of repolarization of the ventricle. And if that becomes too long, you can have something called an R on, um, R on T or T on R, R on T uh, phenomenon that can cause a, a arrhythmias. So the bottom line is, is that you've got to really, really measure very carefully the QTC in patients who you're putting on hydroxychloroquine and or azithromycin. If you're putting them on both, you really got to watch them very carefully. And even though these are both pills that you could take as an outpatient, um, it's probably not advisable to do that uh, because of that uh, cardiac issue. Got a question here from um, Rakesh. He says, why not use steroids to reduce inflammation with COVID-19? Yeah, excellent question. So at the very beginning of all of this, the WHO and a number of, of people said, don't use steroids. It, it's not going to work. It's, it, and, and it was all based on data from the first SARS. It was all based on data from influenza. It, it, they said that, that using steroids was going to increase viral shedding, prolonged viral shedding. And so nobody did it. Nobody touched it. That was the one that was one of the first things that we absolutely knew. We thought we knew that we shouldn't be doing, you know, now we completely, completely, I think we completely, not completely, but for the most part, we mischaracterized exactly what this was going to be like. We thought this was going to be a massive flood of influenza. That's what we thought. Okay. And, and in some respects it is because we are using ventilators for these patients but it's more than that. So I'm wondering, should we be using steroids? I don't know the answer to that question. Um, there are some people that are, are bucking the, 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 um, uh, the trend and they are using steroids. I haven't seen the studies yet. I don't know. It kind of makes sense because if this is an inflammatory condition, maybe steroids are going to be beneficial. But again, we don't know until we have the randomized controlled trials and see whether or not that works. Along those lines, um, you said, you know, this is not COVID-19 has not been what you thought it was going to be uh, yeah. initially. And uh, Jack Looney um, had, had, a, had a good question to kind of sum it up. Bottom line is COVID-19 is systemic vasculitis. And I'll add to that. If not, if you had with what we know now, this has been an evolving disease with what we know now, how would you summarize it in just one paragraph? Yeah, I think at the very beginning of all of this, we thought it was going to be influenza. It's just going to be a bad influenza. It's going to be a lung problem. We're going to need a lot of ventilators. We weren't anticipating strokes. We weren't anticipating blood clots in the lung. We weren't anticipating heart attacks. We weren't anticipating any of that stuff. Not to say you can't get that stuff, even with the influenza virus. You can, but not to this degree, not to the same degree that we're seeing. Because it hits the ACE2 receptor, and there's a lot of ACE2 in the vasculature, I believe that we are seeing significant sequelae in the vascular realm. And as a result of that, I don't want to say that this is all a intravascular problem, um, because certainly there is a respiratory component to it, but that respiratory component may be the result of intravascular pathology in the lungs. And that, um, so if I were to sum it up, I would say that SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 is a multi-organ pathology. It's a multi-organ disease. It primarily affects the lung because I think that's where the virus enters. It could also enter into the olfactory, into the nasal pharynx. And let's face it, the nasopharynx is, is, is part of the respiratory epithelium all the way down into the lungs. 
But if it goes, if it goes bacteria, sorry, if it goes uh, vire viremia, if it goes into the blood, plenty of ACE2 receptors for it to bind to there, plenty of endothelial cells for it to disrupt. As we saw in the New England Journal of Medicine article that was published about a week or so ago, plenty of von Willebrand's factor to be released, thrombosis, hypoxemia, clot, strokes. So it's, it's, it's very complex, Kyle. Okay. And um, here's a question from M. Feinstein. Um, what's the difference between NAC and glutathione precursors like cysteine and glycine? Okay, now you're going to get my biochemistry going. So N-acetylcysteine is a cysteine molecule and an acetyl group put onto the N position. That's why it's called N-acetylcysteine. That's a good thing I was a chemistry major in college. I'm trying to remember how these, the nomenclature, how it's named. So cysteine, though, is one of the amino acids that's in glutathione. As I recall, glutathione is a glutamic acid and a cysteine and a glycine, if I, as I, if I recall correctly. It's those three amino acids. They're not put together like a peptide. There's actually a gamma uh, attachment, I think, of the glutamic acid. So one of the building blocks of glutathione is cysteine. And it's actually the business end of glutathione because that's where it goes around and reduces. And glutathione peroxidase takes that reducing end and reduces uh, hydrogen peroxide to water. And that's one of the reducing pathways in the body. Another one being catalase, and of course the all important superoxide dismutase. Of course there's other ones as well. For instance, there's um, G6PD, glut glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, and there's even xanthine oxidase. So there's a couple of other ones that are, are used in the body, but the uh, NAC, is one of those ways of recharging your glutathione peroxidase system. Excellent. Seen a few questions come in about uh, travel and as our economy opens up to varying degrees in different states, what I know there's no perfect answer to this, you know, travel or don't, or, you know, do we start meeting in, in medium sized groups again? But yeah. what kinds of things are you thinking about, Dr. Schwelt, and, and what general recommendations do you have of peop as people face these difficult questions? Like, do they go and visit their family again in another state? Yeah, so they sh they, we, we want that to happen when it's safe, of course. Um, we are going to have to depend a little bit on our public health officers and determining when they feel that it's safe for that to happen. When they do deem that it's safe for that for it to happen, there's always a chance that they could open up prematurely. And I'll tell you this, uh, when the restaurants, if and when the restaurants open up, I'm not going to be the first ones in there. Um, that's just me personally. Uh, let, let, let the other ones try. Just like I'm not going to be the first one lining up for the vaccine. Uh, you know, make sure that uh, when the first people get it, uh, make sure they don't grow another head or something like that. I, I don't know. Uh, I'm probably not going to be the first one out there rushing out. Let's let's see. Let's make sure that it's the right time and uh, be prudent. That's not to say that I'm going to um, criticize those that are out there first to do it. But it's just me. I'm just that's my personality. What I think that we what we haven't talked a lot about in regards to travel is thinking about a checklist. Um, my wife and I always have a checklist whenever we go on a trip to run down and make sure we have everything that we need to have for that trip because we can always forget things. There's a couple of things that I believe should be added to the post-COVID checklist. And I haven't done a MedCram video on it yet, but I've been thinking about what are some of the things that I would add if I'm gonna be traveling somewhere because it's possible if I'm traveling someplace for more than a week, I could get COVID at my destination and could get sick at my destination. and so. Thinking about buying travel insurance, thinking about buying medical insurance if you're not going to have medical insurance where you're going to be. Maybe buying a pocket pulse oximeter so you can check your oxygen saturation. You know, calling ahead and making sure where the hospitals are and what the facilities are at those hospitals. So you're going to, the informed traveler is going to have to do a little bit more research now because whereas before, you know, the chances of you getting sick were pretty low, now if you're going to travel, uh, the chances of you getting sick are now going to be a little bit higher, especially if you're traveling to a place 
that has a higher incidence of COVID-19. Let's, let's take Hawaii, for instance. If you're gonna to travel to Hawaii, right now Hawaii has one of the lowest incidence of COVID-19 in the United States and the lowest death rate. But I can tell you on the island of Maui, they don't have um, you know, a lot of ventilators. They don't have ECMO. They don't have everybody that gets sick on Maui, they get airlifted out to Honolulu and they don't have a lot of stuff in Honolulu and you're about, you're thousands of miles away from big time technology, right? Kyle, I mean, you, you've been to Hawaii, you kind of know. So yep. these are things that you're gonna have to take into consideration when you're traveling. Start to do some research and think about your, your options. Great, and let's see, Deep Thinking had a question here. Will COVID be eliminated or will it become as endemic as other strains of coronavirus and rhinovirus? And if the latter, will it still be as deadly as it is now or will it, uh, Will, will herd immunity actually bring down the severity? You know, I can tell by the by the very questions that he's asking there that uh, he and I think are on the same page. And it may, it may really be a woman, by the know. way. We don't know. What's that? <laughs> Deep thinking may be a woman. I'm not sure. Oh, okay. She, yeah. So she, she, she or he. Um, you know, we don't know. I've been having the same thoughts myself. I don't know if this is going to just come and disappear or if it's going to be car, part of the cadre of viruses that we get every winter. I, I think it would be every winter um, if it was going to be that way. The second part of that question, though, is is an interesting question, is if it is with us, is it going to be as severe? I, I tend to think that it's probably not going to be as severe because we're going to have enough of the immunity. And even if it changes slightly and you do get symptoms and it's able to reinfect, it's going to be similar in the sense that we have the same sort of thing with the, the, the influenza virus. So when we have small changes in the influenza virus, we get uh, more flu, but it's not as severe as when we get the swine flu, for instance, or these major shifts in the, uh, in the antigen. And, and that's when we get these major uh, epidemics, pandemics, if you will, of, of the swine flu. So I, I think in that sense, it may act very similarly, but we don't know. We don't know the answer to that. Oh, Roger, you still with us? We lost you for a moment. Okay, there you are. You're back. Okay. All right. Yeah, we all we, we take a look at Australia, and I think that's kind of where we look to because that's where they're going into their winter right now, and we'll see if there's a resurgence. Okay, a couple more questions here. Let's uh, see if we can go through these ones pretty quick. So Philip H. had a question. Uh, is it is a practical way of sterilizing your mask just leaving it in your car? You mentioned uh, your if your car gets above I can't remember exactly 130 degrees. That was in your update video today. That yeah. it, it can have a sterilizing effect of the inside of the car. Should you just leave your mask in there too if it's uh, if you're in a hot environment? You know, yeah. If it's a surgical mask, paper mask, you know, it might degrade after a while. If it's one of those cloth masks. Sure, why not? I mean, it's uh, we know that it, it dies in heat, and, and Ford Motor Company, I'm sure, has done its research. Uh, 15 minutes at 133 degrees is probably a good place to start. You could also just wash it, too, if it's a cloth. Antibody testing. Uh, you did a recent video update on some of the problems when there's low prevalence of doing antibody testing. The, the positive yeah. predictive value is much lower than one would want. What role do you think antibody testing currently has in, you know, in our states or in our hospitals, what do you, uh, what do you see? We, what do you think we should do with that? I think, I think, uh, given the low prevalence that there's two uses for it. Number one, if you've got one with a very high specificity so that it reduces the false positive rate, I think you're good. Uh, you can use it. Number two, if you're using it in a population that has a high prevalence, uh, healthcare workers that have been exposed, things of that nature, then I think you're probably going to be okay. Uh, outside of that, if it's positive, you don't know if it's a false positive or if it's a true positive. And you could always do further testing on that, um, multiple testing. Sometimes that improves that, but that's pretty much where it's left. All right. Um, I think one or two more questions here. Any particular studies or drug treatment trials that you're keeping an eye on right now and you're anticipating the results of? 
Yeah, I, I would love to see what happens with the intravenous knack at Sloan Kettering. That that's just because I really feel that knack may have a a, a um, an option there. Um, but of course, the other ones that we're looking at is uh, hydroxychloroquine. I think that that just because everyone's been talking about it, it'd be nice to see finally what the prospective study shows. And then I'd also like to see what the plasma shows. I mean, I really like to know that there's a lot of work that we're trying to do to get that into people. There is some risk when you give plasma to patients, they can get, you know, transfusion reactions. I'd really like to know is does, does that plasma really work? And, and we should be able to find out fairly certainly shortly. That's Johns Hopkins that's doing that research. Any other vectors that we know of to this point, like mosquitoes or even dogs? You know, I don't. I don't think mosquitoes, uh, dogs, I know can get it. I, I don't know if they're a big vector or not, but you know, I don't know what's the incidence of the viremia. That's really the key because uh, the mosquitoes are going to be picking up blood and how much of this virus actually gets into the blood um, in patients with the disease. I'm not, I'm not sure. I don't know. I haven't seen the data on that. Uh, so we'll have to see, you know, you do have to get a pretty good inoculation of the virus. Just one viral particle is not going to infect you. Mm -hmm. And any last question here, any updates that you've heard, seen a few questions come in, including from White Balance uh, is the username. What about any updates on children, on uh, what's going on with children and COVID-19? Yeah, that one I don't have much clinical experience with because I don't treat children. But this post uh, immunomodulary uh, effect where you've got the virus, it's cleared, but the antibodies are now causing problems and it looks like Kawasaki's disease and things. Um, it, it's very, very, uh, concerning. Um, I, but I haven't, I haven't really been on track of that as much as, uh, as the pediatricians are, but we'll, we'll keep an eye on it. Excellent. Well, Dr. Schwelt, can we do this, uh, again, maybe try to do this weekly for a little while? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, any, any, uh, parting words before we sign off? Well, I'm back in the ICU this week. So, um, uh, we'll, we'll try to maybe incorporate some actual uh, data from patients that we're seeing and, and see and, and give some examples. Uh, but the, the videos will probably be a little bit uh, shorter and sweeter and down to earth uh, as, as we uh, battle COVID in, in the ICU again. Well, thanks so much for, uh, for signing on, uh, Dr. Schwell. It was fun. And uh, let's do it again soon. Thank and, you. And thank you all for joining us and for all your, your great questions. And uh, sorry, we didn't get to all of them, but we'll read, we'll read through them afterwards. Thanks yes, again. Thanks, everybody. Good night.